Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast, your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's podcast is brought to you by the fine folks at Man Lake. They've had a commitment to honeybees and beekeepers, both large and small, for over 35 years. They're the industry's leading supplier of beekeeping equipment. Be sure to read about them at manlakelimited.com. That's M-A-N-N-L-A-K-E-L-T-D dot com. On their About Us page, you'll also find out how to collect bee bucks. Hey, Kim. Wow, what a difference a week makes. Yeah. Last week, you were in the middle of the polar vortex, and I was sitting in 50-degree weather. Now we're in the verge of a snowpocalypse here, and you're enjoying 50-degree days. <laughs> I don't know, the Pacific Northwest just isn't used to the snow. Or maybe it's me, I don't know. Last weekend I sat there watching my bees collecting and bringing in pollen from a neighbor's birch trees. Now the bees are all clustered inside keeping warm. I feel bad for them. Makes me think I wish I had them on a pallet headed south along with the other two million colonies from around the country to enjoy the warmth (laughs) and the work in the California almond orchards. I don't know, what do you think? Oh, I, I, I'm right there with you. I don't like to have gone there this year. I've been there a couple of times. I'm hearing a lot of mud this year, so Oof. maybe I'll sit on the outside and watch. But uh, <laughs> yeah, the weather the weather there is going to be, oh, well, you know, it's going to be 54 degrees here today. Nice. And then they're, they're talking this weekend or early next week of another one of those vortex things coming at us. Oh. Uh, so what I heard, the Dakotas today were getting blasted again. I'm about done with winter, I think. I think um, a shot in the almond orchard would be a good a good uh, way to get rid of all this. <laughs> I think so, too. And uh, Speaking of almonds, we've got a good show lined up here today. Yeah, we do. We've got, to, we've got uh, Dr. Reed Johnson from the Ohio State University with us, and he's been doing a lot of work with almonds and pesticides and bees and beekeepers, and um, I look forward to what he's going to be able to tell us. I do too. I, you know, you you have all the experience in uh, in almonds and and uh, soybeans too. So I'm I'm just going to sit back pretty much and listen to this one, and and learn something. Let's call him up and get him on the line right now. Well, Kim, I'm really looking forward to this podcast today, uh, talking to Dr. Reed. Yeah, let me tell you a little bit about him, Jeff. Before we get started, he's an assistant professor at the Ohio State University. And he's located in Wooster, just down the road from me in the same town that Jim too lives in. Oh, yeah. uh, he, he's got to start, interestingly, he got to start in Montana with uh, Dr. Jerry Bromenshank, which is, if you're going to start with bees, I can't think of a better place to, to, to step on board. And, and I, I'm going to imagine that he hit the road full speed and hasn't slowed down since. Uh, he, he did. Uh, he got his PhD from the University of Illinois, working on the honeybee genome project. He did some postdoc work in Nebraska. Now he's teaching biology and beekeeping and pesticide to- toxicology at Ohio State. His research is looking at essentially uh, pesticide, fungicide, insecticide mix toxicology, and and he's well, he's he's doing what. We need a whole lot more with Reed worries about the health of honeybees and 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 why he's here today is because of some of the things that he's been finding, believe it or not, out in almonds. And Reed, welcome Dr. Dr. Johnson, welcome to our show today. I'm glad you could make it. And I gotta ask you, what's a guy from Northeast Ohio doing out in almonds? Well, <laughs> thanks for having me. Uh on your podcast here today. It's, it's a, a, an honor to be, be able to talk with you. Um, so what, yeah, that, that's a good question. What am I doing in almonds? We don't grow a whole lot of almonds here in Ohio. It's, uh, I think this winter we're having would probably kill them pretty quick, actually. <laughs> um, but I, I got into almonds because when I started here as a new assistant professor in 2011, I got a call um, from Christy Heinz at Project Apis M. And she had heard from beekeepers out in almonds in California, particularly queen breeders, and they were seeing their developing queens were dying um, from some unknown reason. And at the time, they thought it was fungicide exposure during bloom and these fungicide applications during bloom. Um, So I I packed up and I, I hired an undergraduate here at Ohio and we went out to... Uh, Central Valley of California. And that undergrad stayed in Chico for 
uh, six weeks or eight weeks and worked with the Conans there, uh, a big queen producer. Um, and we, we worked with them to test different fungicides and try to get to the bottom of why the queens were dying uh, back 10 years ago now. Um, and I mean, that's how I ended up in almonds is, is really because Project Apis M and Christy Heinz really encouraged me to go out there and engage with uh, the problems that are happening in almonds. Well, it certainly uh, uh, it, it makes perfect sense. And knowing Christy and knowing Project Apis M, um, I can see how they got involved. Uh, so what did you find after you got out there? So we found that it was not the fungicide. So we set up a, an experiment where we um, did these, uh, we called them swarm boxes. You know, you put your grafts into a box filled with uh, five pounds of nurse bees and some sugar water and our contaminated pollen, which we had contaminated at different levels with the pristine. And we went all the way up to 400 parts per million pristine, which is like a, a ridiculously high level, uh, probably at least a hundred times what they would experience, you know, if, if pristine was sprayed in almonds and we found no effect on queen development. That was not the, appeared not to be the, the cause of the problems that the queen, queen breeders were experiencing. But we, in that, in that experiment, we included an insecticide as a positive control that we had a strong suspicion really would kill uh, these developing queens. And that insecticide was diflubenzron or demolin, this is an, an IGR, an insect growth regulator insecticide, and it works by inhibiting uh, chitin synthesis. And chitin is the, what makes up the exoskeleton on, on bees and all insects. And these are a unique class of insecticides because they are really not toxic to any adult insect because adult insects are no longer synthesizing chitin for their exoskeleton. They already have an exoskeleton. They don't need to make a new one. And so as a result, it's, it's really only effective at killing immature insects like caterpillars or maybe queen larvae. Um, and there was some literature showing that this would be effective at, at killing queens, which is what we wanted. We wanted a positive control, something that would really hammer those queens we were putting in the boxes. And so we included that um, as the positive control for that experiment. Uh, and at, at the time, uh, BASF, the, the manufacturer of Pristine was very interested in this work because we were working on you know, their fungicide. And they were, they were actually very concerned that they were causing the problems that the queen breeders were experiencing. And so they were putting some research effort into this. And at the time, they were trapping pollen um, from uh, during almond bloom to see what, you know, are they exposed to Pristine during bloom? What kind, what levels, what other pesticides are, are, are bees exposed to during that period. And they found, uh, surprisingly, that the bees were exposed to our positive control, diflubenzron or dimelin. And at the time, nobody knew that insecticides were being used in almonds during bloom. And that was a, for me, that was just like an earth-shaking revelation uh, we we just got really lucky in, in in using that as our positive control, and then only finding out later that yes, this this insecticide was used on tens of thousands of acres of almonds during bloom, and that that was likely the culprit uh, for the the problems queen breeders were experiencing with with queen development. Don't <clears throat> maybe things have changed, but as as, far, as I recall. You don't spray an almond orchard unless a pesticide applicator consultant person uh, pretty much okays what you're going to apply. Wasn't that the case back then? Well, there was, there was nothing illegal about applying dimelin during bloom. Well, it's not, it's not that it was illegal. It's just that if I wanted one of the pesticide, one of the pesticide people that was working with me would say, you need to apply this chemical to control this insect because I've been out scouting and I've found that you have a pest level that needs treatment. That information wasn't just routinely available. Well, I mean, it, it was, it was, I mean, it was not, not a secret by any means that uh, insecticides were going on. It's just that the, I guess the, the people in extension and the people at the almond board who are advising 
what to apply during this period did not have insecticides on their recommendation yeah, list. Yeah. Nobody was yeah. recommending this. It was kind of, uh, they had come about this through their own means to apply this insecticide during bloom to control the peach twig borer um, with this, these insecticides. What an eye opener that must have been. It was, I, I was surprised that, that everyone was so surprised by it, honestly. Um, <laughs> Because it was out there in plain sight. I mean, if, if they, anybody had talked to these applicators, I'm sure they would have said. And it was, it was hidden in plain sight in the California pesticide use database. And California yeah. is really unique in the fact that they uh, record, well, every place they record the pesticides that they use. But in California, they aggregate that into the statewide database that is then publicly available. And anybody can go to the California Department of Pesticide Regulation website and download all the pesticides that are applied to any crop for any year uh, going back into the 90s. Um, and so that, that's what I did next is I, I started mining that California pesticide use database to see what extent of insecticide application was going on during almond bloom. And, and the results were kind of eye-opening that, um, you know, back then there were maybe 800,000 acres of almonds and 100,000 of those acres were receiving an insecticide application during bloom, which was, um, I mean, it was, the data was there for everyone to look at. It's just no one had really looked at it to know the extent that the insecticides were being applied. I, I recall way back when, when I was working in extension in Wisconsin, one of the things that we did, one of the things that we were taught was that you can spray apples during bloom with a fungicide because it has no effect on the bees that are foraging in the apples. And lo and behold, what we found was that the foragers were picking up pollen from those sprayed apple blossoms, taking it back, storing it, feeding it to their young down the road later in the summer. And the levels of fungicide were doing basically the same thing. They were damaging the larva and they weren't hatching. So you would have colony loss in July from pollen collected in, in May in Wisconsin. And, and uh, it, took, it took many seasons to figure out what was going on. So I can understand, I can understand the, 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 uh, those two pieces being unhooked and not being put together until later. Uh, that was a nice piece of detective work that you did there. I, I got really lucky in that everything just kind of came together. It was, I mean, in, in retrospect, it seems obvious, but it was, I mean, it was really... Um, I, I owe a lot to the, the folks at BASF because they were the ones that, that tipped me off. They were finding difflubenzone. I mean, obviously, they, had, they were happy to point at something else that it was not pristine. Um, so they, but, I mean, it was that communication, that line of communication with their environmental toxicologists to, that was critical to figuring this thing out. Well, I, I'm going to guess that that practice is no longer being... Um uh, carried out in almond orchards? So based on the most recent uh, data from the pesticide use database, there are still about 50,000 acres that receive an insecticide application during bloom. That was 2016. Um, hopefully, is the, it takes a, a long time for that stuff to become publicly available. Um, but hopefully those numbers have dropped uh, in the last couple of years. And ideally in 2019, that number will be zero acres um, because there's been a real push by the almond board to tell people not to use insecticides during bloom. Are there regulations in effect that an almond grower has to notify his pollinator, his beekeeper, when he's going to spray? I, I don't know about that. I mean, these are not um, most of the insecticides used. Now, uh, Dimelin now has some bee warnings on the label. It did not at the time. Um, but there are a, a handful of insecticides that are appear to be pretty bee safe, and they don't carry any warning on the on the pesticide label. And I think that would not require any sort of, um, you know, within state law to require legal notification. Though beekeepers probably in their contracts and hopefully are 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 asking for that kind of information uh, when they provide their bees for pollination. So it wasn't, a, it wasn't a synergistic effect, a non-toxic insecticide and a non-toxic fungicide coming together and being a toxic application. It was simply the insecticide. 
it, it, in that, that queen study, we believe it was just the insecticide. And we've followed up on that in our more recent work, looking at, at combination effects of the diflubenzron with the other fungicides that it could be co-applied with in a tank mix. And I mean, it's toxic alone. It's toxic with fungicides. It, it doesn't really make any difference. Well, the other thing, oh, of course, going on out there, uh, Jeff, have you ever uh, been fortunate enough to walk through almond orchards in California? No, I was hoping to do that at some point. It looks beautiful. They are. The one thing that, that, that you notice right away is that if you have bees in, in grower A's orchard, grower B right next door may be doing something totally different in terms of pest control, having different pest pressures or having a different spray schedule. And your grower could be perfect and the guy next door actually could be perfect, but you're not prepared for what the guy next door is doing and your bees don't recognize boundaries. And they're in both orchards at the same time. So suddenly you end up with a problem and you don't know where it came from. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Without without doing the kind of work that uh, that Reed was doing there and searching, and from talking to beekeepers, um, uh, the data that you that you were able to search Reed was it's not available tomorrow. It's down the road six eight weeks before you're able to uh, get a hold of that, as I understand it. So the the data about the pesticide use, right? Correct. Oh, it's more than six or eight weeks. It's usually about two years. Yeah. So, so you suffer a loss, you have a problem, and two years later, oh, there it is. Now I know what. Well, is this gonna is this gonna solve a lot of problems? This discovery of yours? Well, I mean, I, I'm optimistic that it will help, um, you know, reduce bee kills in in almonds during pollination. Um, but I mean, it's it's not the panacea that I mean, people are doing what they probably should have been doing in the first place was is not applying insecticides during bloom. I mean, bees have all sorts of other, other problems, and there's other pesticide issues that are unrelated to what's going into almonds, even out in California, because there are, are other crops out there uh, that could be receiving uh, you know, more potent insecticide applications. And, and there have certainly been reports of, of sprays to other crops that have, have harmed bees that had gotten into them kind of uh, by chance and that almonds were not even involved. Well, if I'm not, if I'm not raising queens, I just, I, I, I bring 450 colonies on a truck out there. I put them in an orchard. I come back in six weeks, pick them up and take them home. What am I, as a beekeeper, just with bees, not queens, what am I seeing? What are the symptoms? How long does it take to, to really see that I've been, I've been zapped with this pesticide? So, so in our more recent work, um, we've looked at the effect on worker larvae and worker adults. And uh, we've tested, again, that, that diflubenzron or demolin, um, and that stuff will kill, it doesn't just kill queen larvae, it will also kill worker larvae. Um, and I'm not exactly sure what you would observe there. I mean, people have reported seeing um, bees that fail to develop worker bees that fail to develop. And that is potentially related to, to dimlin exposure. Um, this more recent work found this synergistic interaction between uh, a newer class of insecticides, the uh, ryanidine receptor agonists, which is uh, one of the newest classes actually. And the, the one that they use in almonds would be Altacor or, um, and they, they, that can be tank mixed with uh, fungicides, the fungicide being propiconazole or tilt is what we tested. And that particular combination takes an insecticide that is, is actually quite bee safe. We have tried to kill bees with, with the chlorotrinilopril or Altacor by itself, and it's, it's astonishingly bee safe. But it's, it's only when you mix it with this fungicide that you reduce, likely reduce the bee's ability to detoxify that insecticide, and then it becomes... Um, you know, harmful for the bees, and you can kill adult bees as well as larvae uh, when that particular combination of the propiconazole and chlorotrinolpril were applied to larvae together or to adults together. And but I, as far as what would happen in the field, um, again, I'm based in Northeast Ohio. All the all the tests that we've done have been uh, laboratory tests or tests on these shaker box boxes where we're rearing uh, grafted queens. 
Uh, and I have not actually seen the flowers of the California almonds yet myself. So I, hopefully I can make it out there one of these days to see, see almonds in bloom and actually uh, get my feet on the ground and, and, and see the effects, see the whole scene and, and try to nail down the effects of, of this exposure on, on whole colonies. Well, I wonder if, if, if I was a beekeeper taking bees out there and I know that this issue exists, I'd be talking to my grower a lot about what not to do to my bees out there. Now, I know I just mentioned that the guy next door may or may not uh, be doing that, but from where, as a beekeeper, where can I, you just rattled off names of a whole lot of compounds that I personally don't know anything about, but I'm going to bet beekeepers do, and I know growers do, so where can they get this kind of information, beekeepers get this kind of information and say, here's the scoop, don't do this. Don't use these. Don't don't harm my bees, or I'm not coming back, or whatever. After doing this research and talking to a lot of people, I've been going to the uh, Alma Board of California's meeting that they have there in Sacramento in December, um, and talking to people there. Uh, it, it seems that the the recommendation is really very straightforward, and this is included in the. Uh, best management practices for pollination that is put out by the Almond Board of California. And that's just simply do not apply insecticides during bloom. That's it. That's pretty straightforward. I have to either do or don't. And, and the don't is what you want to do. So, so again, going back as uh, if I'm a beekeeper, that's at the top of my contract uh, before it ever says, hello, it says, don't spray insecticides during bloom. That's the, that's the, the deal breaker, I would guess. I, I mean, I think it should be. I, I, I mean, some of these insecticides, I mean, it, it, it's, it's amazing to me that some insecticides, for whatever reason, are so bee safe. And, and this chlorotronilaprol, um, and another one, there's the methoxyphenazide or intrepid, um, appear to be, at least in the tests that we've done, uh, they, they appear to be relatively safe. Um, but we have not, I mean, this is just based on the limited lab tests that we've done, and there could certainly be effects from these insecticides that we have not tested for. And, I mean, it's, it's a honeybee colony is a very complex superorganism. There's a lot of stuff going on in there, and we don't know how uh, these insecticides might be influencing them. I mean, because they are insecticides, they interact with insects on some level. And so I think that the safest thing is just not to apply them. Especially when you consider that many of the colonies, if not all of the colonies, are weakened because of the various uh, 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 diseases brought on by the varroa. So you already have a, a weakened colony who's exposed to the synergistic effect of the fungicide or, and the insecticide or just the insecticide that should be safe, but against the weakened colony, it's uh, damaging. I, I like your no, no spray while in bloom approach. I think that's best. It's a nice, simple message. <laughs> yeah. um, and I, I agree. There's, there's, um, when you start talking about combinations and bees, the layers of different combinations, because, I mean, you brought up a good point. I mean, these bees have, have their own problems, the mites and then the viruses that are present. And, you know, how, do, how does an insecticide and a fungicide and a viral infection, how, is, is that more damaging than in the absence of the viral infection? There's, there's a lot of different, different combinations combinations that you would need to test and it, it, it just quickly becomes uh, intractable, I think is the word, where you just can't test everything. And I mean, that's kind of why we've fallen back to this very simple, straightforward message. And it, I mean, I still do have some concerns about the fungicides, um, but there's a, a much more compelling case from the almond growers perspective for using the fungicides. I think getting them to not apply fungicides is going to be far more of an uphill battle than getting them to not apply insecticides because, you know, no, nobody was recommending application of insecticides because it's not, um, the timing for this is obviously not ideal. And in reality, um, there are better opportunities to control the peach twig borer. You can spray for them with some real good, um, bee killing insecticides, 
when the bees are not there because there are better insecticides available after the bees are gone. Well, chemicals are cheap, but labor is expensive. So if I'm going to go across that orchard and I can put two chemicals on, I'm probably going to do that and save that labor cost. But uh, at what cost to beekeepers? So I guess... Well, I mean, I think that's what it was, is uh, putting insecticides in that tank mix was probably viewed as, as cheap insurance. You know, in case there is a pest problem, they'll knock them back with that insecticide because it's yeah the labor is the expensive part it's the uh yeah, yeah and the cost of that insecticide was just a, a marginal increase in the cost of the application have you heard of any other crops that are running into this kind of a problem i'm very interested right now in blueberries because i continue to hear people um complain about mysterious somewhat similar mysterious losses of of larvae in blueberries and i they don't generally apply insecticides to blueberries, so I don't know what the story is there. I don't, I don't think I can explain it with the work that we've done so far. Are these the blueberries in Maine, the wild blueberries, or these are the, the uh, domestic crop? The domestic ones in New Jersey and Michigan, and I've, I've heard beekeepers in British Columbia have, have complained to me. Um, we, I've, I've talked at length with some beekeepers from British Columbia about the, the problems they've experienced pollinating blueberries up there. So it's not limited to the United States, it appears to be more of a broad North American issue with something with blueberries. Well, certainly certainly information that uh, beekeepers need to take, no matter the crop they're pollinating, they need to take to their growers. And boy, if you get away with it, put that at the top of your contract. Don't spray during bloom, period. Reed, you got to, I want to, I want to, I want to explore some of the other things you're involved in here in Ohio, closer to home. Uh, but um, is there, is there something you want to leave this with uh, a message or something for growers, for beekeepers, for anybody involved in, in this issue? Because it is, it is a problem. And, and, and it, when you start killing bees, you start killing beekeepers essentially. So uh, Give me a message to give to growers. I mean, I, th- I think it's that, that same old kind of boring message. Just don't apply insecticides during bloom. Um, okay. And if, if you can get away with not applying anything during bloom, that would be better. Um, I, I know one of the things that the way they've mitigated bee exposure is application in at night or – and that, that has the potential to reduce the amount of, of spray that bees are, are – encountering if, if they're not actually spraying through the, the mist. So bees aren't encountering this spray. It's, it's, they're, they're spraying during the day when bees are flying, as opposed to putting it on, as you say, at night and the bees visit the blossom the next day, and it's not nearly the issue? Well, most flowers close at night, and you have a totally new flower will open the following morning. And that flower, because it was closed when the spray went on, should be uncontaminated. And the bees aren't interested in these dead flowers that are spent. They're visiting the new flowers that have just opened okay. this morning. So it's, I think it can be, uh, I mean, it's, it's a pretty simple solution. Uh, it may not be the whole solution, but it's a pretty simple thing to reduce bee exposure to not just the insecticides, but anything that might need to go on during bloom is just to spray uh, late in the day or ideally at night um, and fresh new flowers will open in the morning and the bees will, I mean, you could probably reduce bees exposure uh, by a great amount by just following that simple, that simple guidance. Well, it's a good message to send to everybody out there. It's going to hit, it's going to happen in about what a week, 10 days. Uh, the early stuff will start blooming if it's the normal year. So um, you guys got that much long, that much longer to get ready and not spray. Period. Let's look at it that way. Reed, <clears throat> I know that you're also involved in some work here in in uh, in Ohio, looking at a very different uh, aspect of bee research, uh, and it has to do with uh, looking at forage patterns. Uh, tell me a little bit about that, and then I want to get into some of the stuff where you and I touch base. So we've. Uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of a jump to go from pesticides to foraging, but we were originally really interested in where bees are encountering the pesticides. You know, they go across the landscape, and we looked at trying to map their foraging as a way to map their intersection between um, 
foraging and pesticide exposure. And that's, that's a really challenging thing to do. Um, but we've made some real progress on, you know, answering foraging questions. Um, and I had a graduate student a few years ago uh, named Doug Sponsler. He's now at, at Penn State as a, as a postdoc in Christina Grosinger's lab. And he was the one that really did a lot of this work. Um, he he uh, was especially interested in where bees are foraging in urban areas. And he found that... Um, he did a survey of a bunch of beekeepers in Ohio that were starting new packages and just followed the success of those packages uh, over the, the subsequent summer. And he found the kind of surprising thing that bees were doing much better in agricultural areas than they were in urban areas. They had more frames of honey in September after being started as a package in, in April. Uh, had more frames of honey by September if they were surrounded by an agricultural landscape rather than an urban landscape or even a forested landscape. Um, so it, it kind of demonstrated to us that the agricultural areas here in Ohio are the, are the premier place to keep your bees uh, if you want them to make honey and to survive uh, over the winter. Um, and that's, I guess, despite the fact that there are, are pesticides being, out the, being applied out there in you know, the corn and soybean dominated agriculture that we have here in the Midwest. As I understand it, probably most of the soybeans here are seed treated. Soybean, I believe this, the penetration of the soybean seed treatments has gotten up in the 80% range in Ohio and probably throughout the Midwest. Um, so most soybean is now seed treated. And that seed treatment is a, uh, I think it's either imidacloprid or thymothoxin. These are two neonicotinoid insecticides with just incredibly toxic to bees, as I'm sure many people are aware. Um, but as far as I understand it, um, soybeans don't have the dust off issue. So we've done some work on corn is a real problem with the seed treatments because the, that, that insecticide on there will dust off and, and bees can become exposed in that way. But soybeans, it's got a smoother, more uniform surface and the insecticide seed treatment sticks on there pretty well. So you don't have it dusting off and it goes into the ground. And then these are systemic insecticides. So they could theoretically be present in the soybean nectar produced by the, the soybean plant where bees could then uh, be exposed to you know, very low concentrations of it. Well, these are, when you've got a seed treated crop, are they also spraying for uh, pests that the seed treatment isn't controlling? Well, that's... <sighs> Seed treatments are pretty controversial among entomologists because they're, they're actually not that effective against most of the serious pests that corn and soybeans have. Um, this is always depressing to me doing any research on this is that we're solving a problem that probably shouldn't exist in the first place because these, <laughs> these, these seed treatment insecticides are, are, I mean, pretty clearly just drastically overused. Um, because the seed treatments are really good at protecting the seed. And there are some insect pests that will attack corn and soybean seeds. These are like the uh, seed corn maggot. And there's other like, pests that will attack either the seed or the very young plant. And at that stage, there's still lots of insecticide left from that seed treatment. And the plant is very well protected against any, any pest. But when the plant grows, and this could be either corn or soybeans, that insecticide quickly gets diluted and it's probably washed away through the soil. So there's not a whole lot left by the time you have a mature plant. Um, and so for things in corn, like the corn rootworm or the soybean aphid in soybeans, uh, these seed treatments are just not effective uh, against those pests. Um, in, in corn, it's the, the, the uh, BT that's been genetically engineered into the corn that is doing the heavy lifting against the corn rootworm. Uh, the seed treatment is not what's being effective there. And in soybean, uh, yeah, if you have a soybean outbreak, uh, a traditional insecticide application is what is going to be needed to control soybean aphids. Um, that seed treatment is not going to protect the plant. So yeah, you'll have a seed treatment in soybeans. And then if you have a soybean aphid problem, they'll need to come back and do another insecticide application to, to control that. So Okay, so you're getting you're getting both. You're getting you're getting the systemic action for a while from the seed treatment, and then perhaps, but not necessarily, a spray later. Um, 
So apparently the sprays um, in, in an agriculture setting are, are not significantly detrimental to the health of a colony. Well, I, I don't know if that's the right interpretation. I mean, it's tempting to say that. Um, but I think that the reality, and I, I don't, this is something we're actively researching this summer. I think it's just that the agricultural environment is, is so good that it's making up for any losses caused by the pesticide exposure that the bees receive in that environment. So they're doing better in agricultural areas, but I think in the absence of, of this insecticide exposure, they would be doing even better, if that makes sense. How much foraging did you see those bees doing? Did you were you able to go and look and see how much foraging these bees were doing in soybeans? So we this is a really interesting question whether bees are visiting soybean or not. And I know beekeepers here in Ohio, this is kind of a topic of some debate um, whether bees are visiting soybean uh, at all. Um, so we've we've looked at soybean in two ways. Um, first, we've looked at uh, soybean pollen that's in honey. And you can, um, even if bees are, are not collecting pollen from soybean, uh, a little bit of that soybean pollen will end up in the nectar that the bees are collecting, and they'll store that in their, their crop, and they'll take that back, and they'll make honey out of that, and that, 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 that pollen will be present in the honey made from soybean. And we can put that in a centrifuge and spin it down and pull out this pollen that's left over in the honey and, and do kind of our own... Uh, honey authentication. This is the kind of stuff that Von Bryant at Texas A&M was doing for many, right. many years. You know, what plant did this this honey come from? So we've been doing that specifically focused on soybean. And uh, over the last few years, we've had beekeepers bring in uh, honey samples to the Ohio State Beekeepers Association fall meeting. And they've, they brought these honey samples from all over the state. Um, because beekeepers are very interested in this question, actually. And uh, we've, we've had them provide those with the goal that someday we'll be able to provide them with the results of, you know, what their bees were foraging on. We, it, it, in reality, it takes a long time to do these analyses. Um, but we found evidence of soybean pollen in about half of the samples that were brought in, um, which I think is pretty potent evidence that bees are definitely foraging on soybean. We, and we've, that's of like 70 samples that were brought in in the first year. Half of those samples contain soybean pollen. And we did some, some more detailed analysis. We did some, uh, we looked at the landscape around each of the apiaries that had provided those, those honey samples and measured the amount of soybean agriculture that was within the foraging range of the bees in those apiaries. And we found that the more soybean is around the apiary, the more soybean pollen is present in that honey, which is pretty good evidence that the bees are, are using it. Um, <laughs> And so the second way that we've looked at bee foraging in soybean is by doing a classical waggle dance interpretation. And this is some really, really fun work. If uh, I'm sure most people know about the waggle dance that bees do. And this is how a forager bee can communicate to her sisters the location of a really, a really prime patch of flowers that, that she's trying to recruit those other foragers to come visit and to help, you know, collect more, more pollen or, or nectar for the hive. Well, we videotaped um, the dance floor, this bottom frame in observation hives uh, at some observations hives that we had placed essentially in the middle of this you know, really heavily agricultural area with lots of corn and soybeans around them. And we recorded those dances and then we painstakingly mapped out those dances. This took many, many hours of undergraduate labor uh, so Sri Lakshmi Suresh is the undergraduate who did all of this. So I, I'm indebted to her to, for, for doing that. And, and we, we produced a map of where bees were foraging at this one site um, to see if the bees were actually recruiting their sisters to go to soybean fields. And surprisingly, from about one half kilometer to one and a half kilometers distant from the colony, there was actually positive recruitment two soybean fields. The, the bees, it's, there's evidence that the bees were recruiting their sisters to forage in soybean fields at that range. Well, uh, I got to tell you, as you well know, I'm not surprised. Um, I did a lot of work with Eric Erickson in Wisconsin a lot of years ago. Um, 
and and down in the boot hill of Miss, uh, Missouri, looking at the same thing. And um, lo and behold, yes, bees do visit. Uh, I, I spent days and days getting into a soybean book field before dawn and waiting for them to come and visit because they would be done by about 10 or 10.30 in the morning. The, the flower had, had had done what it was going to do and, and it was done for the day and the bees wouldn't come back and they knew how to tell time. Um, but So that doesn't surprise me. And, and what we were studying is what can we do to make soybeans produce more honey? But uh, uh, you're looking at it from a totally different different perspective. But I, I, what I find about interesting about this is that what we found uh, back then was that uh, soy or hundred um, honeybee visitation was critical was critically affected by temperature. If the if the temperature wasn't above eighty five. The soybeans weren't producing hardly enough to warrant visiting, whereas down as you see in southern uh, Missouri, you've got that kind of temperature all of the time, and soybean honey, at least then, was a viable uh, was a viable honey crop. Um, so, did you see temperature effects on that, any of this? Do you know? Well, we tried to we deliberately. Um, I guess we kind of put our thumb on the scales on that. We we went out and did our dance recordings on those kinds of hot days because we and thank you for doing that research, Kim, because those are, those are excellent papers that, that everyone in the lab has read. Um, you were really a, a pioneer in the world of, of soybean, <laughs> uh, bee foraging on soybeans. So that's, I mean, that's really, really excellent work that we've, we've built upon. Um, so yeah, we, so we tried to, to, look at, at these dances during days we thought that bees were likely to be foraging on soybean. Those were particularly hot days. We would go out there and do our recordings. Yeah. Well, that's good. You know, and then you get, then you're able to get data, you know, sitting in a soybean field at six thirty in the morning at 45 degrees is, I was one of those undergrads that you were, <laughs> but you also, you said you're also doing some work in urban areas. So um, this was largely Doug's project and he's taken this with him. He's now doing, uh, looking at bee foraging in urban Philadelphia. And I, I haven't talked to him recently to know how that's going, but um, at least the, the work he did here in Ohio, we, we were really kind of depressed about how poor urban areas seem to be for bees, um, which is really um, unfortunately, because so many people that have gotten into beekeeping recently are urban beekeepers, um, and it really raises the question, how can we make our urban spaces uh, compete with agricultural areas for bee forage? How can we improve them to make them a, a better home for urban bees? And I think, um, I mean, it's not just soybean that they're foraging on out in those agricultural areas. You know, there's lots of roadside and, and field margins and all sorts of kind of semi-wild spaces that might get mowed occasionally that can really have, you know, abundant clovers or goldenrods that are probably providing a lot of that later season forage that showed up in that, that survey uh, work that Doug did. We have lots of grass in urban areas. Well, grass, grass is, uh, is nice and green. Um, I guess it's good for playing golf on. <laughs> Medina, Medina may be a little bit different. We've got, we've got the, there, the street people um, look for trees that provide forage for bees and it, um, it has the influence of the AI root company over the years. Uh, and a lot of them, it would be interesting to talk to Tony Burnham in Washington, DC, or the people at uh, Berg's bees in, in Pittsburgh to see how, if there's a difference, you know, um, what's their forage and and how well do their bees do? So you're not you're not involved in that part of this anymore. Are you continuing on with the uh, with the uh, looking at soybeans and all the rest of those? Yeah, we're we're very very interested in soybean because I think that is um, really of, of incredible importance for the state of Ohio, and they, they pay my salary, thankfully. Um, uh, well, because I, we did some calculations looking at the, you know, land cover databases, and 17% of the state of Ohio is soybean. 
seven. I mean, that's the whole land. I mean, it, it, it's, I guess it's not that impressive, but a lot of the state is forested. I'm sure if you go out to Iowa, it's, it's probably closer to 30 or 40%. Um, yeah. is, is soybean. And if that, that soybean, I, I think we really need to, to make this connection between bees and soybeans because, uh, I mean, the pesticide issue is is important, and people are spraying for soybean aphid now when they, they weren't years ago. But I think that if so much of our landscape is already being managed for a um, a pollinator friendly crop, then I think we need to appreciate that. And additionally, the soybean growers have something to gain here as well because there's as much as a fifteen percent increase in yield uh, for soybeans with honeybee visitation. And that's, that's something we're very interested in. We're, we're going to be working on that this summer is trying to measure the increase in soybean yield if we go out and we put a colony of bees smack dab in the middle of a soybean field, just as a proof of concept to see if we can boost yield by putting bees where there probably are not as many bees. I can tell you something. If you want to have fun with this, if you next summer, if you got a, a, a huge field with nothing nothing around you, go put a chair in it about 50 yards from your bee colony, and you will see the yield around that chair much higher than 40 yards away. And if you've got a power line running across that field, sometimes you'll see the yield next to the posts going across because it gives bees something to focus on. Um, we measured that. It, it was, you could predict it to the, to the bean by almost because of the fact that well, go to the go to the post and turn left, and that's where you want to be, as opposed to where do I go when I'm out here? I mean, because there's nothing for them to orient to. Right. It's just like this massive 300 acre field of soybe- soybeans. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Is there a uh, difference in the flowers between the varieties of soybean, or does everyone producing and, and planting the same soybean now? As far as I understand it, there's a lot of variability in the soybeans people are planting. Um, and uh, Chia Lin, my research, uh, a research scientist in my lab working in Columbus, is working with someone in the, our Horton Crop Science Department where they've got these test plots where they've got a dozen different soybean varieties. And she's been out there with some undergraduates with uh, Kim's lawn chair looking at <laughs> the, the bees that are visiting these different soybean varieties at different time periods to, to see if we can identify, you know, maybe some varieties are really especially uh, attractive to bees. Exactly. And we could, maybe those are the ones that we want to encourage people to plant. And that's what I was wondering, because when I lived there in Hinkley, I was surrounded by soybean. I mean, the, the farmer, our house was put into two acres of the, the soybean field and and I remember going out in the soybean field thinking, yeah, I'm going to get a lot of honey. This is going to be great for the bees, but I could never see any bees working it. Now, it might have been what Kim suggested, and I just was out there after work and not in the morning when the flowers were producing. But I just don't remember. Uh, I thought it was a big bust. I, and so that's, I always wondered, well, was that because the, the flower was not conducive to the bee or wasn't attractive to the bee or maybe just soybean in general? So this has been a fun discussion to just sit back and listen to. You find some varieties we found the flowers never <clears throat> the typical legume flower, and the flowers never open. It's just dis- distinct to the variety, and some of them are very temperature dependent. If it's cold, they're not going to open. If it gets really hot, they'll open up. Uh, and then there are things you can do to the fertility of the soil to enhance nectar production, which enhances the attractiveness of the beans. So, um, I, I, I'd like I, I, I'm going to follow what you're doing here because it's picking up where we left off. It, it only took us what forty years. <laughs> well, that's okay. They're still making soybean honey down in Missouri, so uh, they're just sitting there. You guys just finally figured it out. Huh? Okay. <laughs> well, what's on your plate for the future? Well, we're continuing to do almond stuff, and I really would like to go out to almonds and do some some work on the ground there. So we're, we're submitting a proposal to do some of that. Um, and there's new pesticides, you know, some new fungicides that I think really need to be tested that are probably going to be seeing increased use in almonds. And we're going to test that and try to really nail down some of the, the fungicide effects because I, I've been talking about insecticides, but I'm not going to let fungicides off the hook just yet. I think there's the, there is the potential um, for those to cause some damage. The other thing we're looking at is the adjuvants. 
And these are the, uh, the products that are added to the tank to increase the rain fastness or the penetration of the, the pesticide that's being applied. And uh, there's a dizzying number of these different adjuvants that are applied throughout agriculture. And they're applied very pervasively in almonds during bloom. A uh, lot of different variety there, but just trying to get our hands around whether the presence of this adjuvant is going to increase the toxicity of a fungicide or insecticide fungicide combination and just try to begin getting our hands around that. I know we've, we're running up on the end of time here. One of the questions that I, because it's been in the news lately and I would just, maybe you can touch base on it and then we can come back to it at a future podcast, but regarding soybean, what about the genetically modified uh, uh, seeds like dicamba and the extend soybeans and everything and the pollen is that anybody studied the effect of those di- uh, genetically modified pollen on on the growth of the bee larva or other insects so i believe most pollen so people have looked at the the bt pollen uh, that's the most concern because bt is an insecticide but the uh the herbicide resistant, I don't believe that the pollen is going to be a problem for the bees. I mean, not to say, not to let the herbicide resistant technology off the hook, though. The, the problem with that stuff is the herbicide that's applied that can then be applied and not kill the soybeans. Because I know, particularly with dicamba and potentially with 2,4-D, these things have the, the propensity to drift across the landscape. And these, these herbicides can kill, they don't kill the soybean but they kill all the wildflowers and the weeds that the bees were foraging on. And so the, the herbicides are, are, can really reduce the nutritional value of a landscape to bees by killing all these, these flowers that they're depending on. Yeah. A lot to think about. A lot, a lot impacting the honeybee. And, they, and they're, on top of that, they have the varroa, as we were talking about earlier. So that's... Well, we're, we're, that's them. another angle that I would even touch on. We're, we're looking at... Uh, I mean, I guess that's the everyone's holy grail is some new way to kill varroa mites. Um, so we're working a bit on that here. I mean, there's uh, the problem is not solved. I'll tell you that. Well, I'm glad to see that uh, you and Wooster and Ohio State are still heavily involved in bees and, and working strongly in, in uh, finding solutions and answers to our beekeeping problems and questions. No shortage of problems to find the answers to. <laughs> Good. Oh, I hope you can come back and visit it with us again, Reed. This has been this has been wonderful, and and I hope uh, almond pollinator beekeepers and almond growers gain something from this today. And um, I think we can close on don't spray during bloom period, and leave it at that. Sounds like a good message. <laughs> okay, Reed. Thank you again for visiting with us today. We hope to have you back again. Thanks. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Reed. It's good to hear there are good researchers working on problems facing bees out there in the almond orchards. I'm sure his work's going to be applicable to any blooming crop. Yeah, I think the take-home message here is really simple, Jeff. Don't spray during bloom, period. Yeah, true. Uh, it's, it's just basic, fundamental common sense, but uh, it wasn't working for a, a long time out there. And he used a good phrase, hidden in plain sight. They had the data. They knew they knew. People knew what they were doing, and they were doing it on purpose, not because they wanted to harm bees, but because they thought it wouldn't harm bees. So going across the field with a fungicide and an insecticide saved them a whole lot of labor, and it seemed to make sense. Once they found out what it was doing, though, once Reed's work came to light, um, one would hope that that practice has stopped and that Dimelin is no longer being used during bloom. I'd like to see that as uh, uh, across the board with all crops. However, he mentioned blueberries, but I'm going to guess that there's a lot of blooming crops that some growers sometimes have have tank mixed with a, a product like this that has caused problems. The beekeeper doesn't know until three, four, five weeks later what's going on. He can't. He looks back. He says, "What happened yesterday to kill all these bees?" And actually, it happened quite a while ago while sitting in an orchard or on a farm someplace. So uh, it's it's good to know that this problem has been solved. And it's also good to know that people are going to start thinking about what could be possibly going wrong. It's good to know that when a beekeeper has a problem, now there's someplace else to look rather than in the field next door. It may be something that occurred 
some time ago. So it gives beekeepers a, a heads up. It also gives growers a heads up on what not to do. And I hope Reed's work really, really sinks in everywhere. I'm glad he was able to do it, and, and I'm glad that the results are being spread around. i tell you the other thing I liked about his talk, though, was his work on soybeans. Uh, I did that work 40 years ago, and he's just picking it up now. So it was good to see that uh, continued. And and the, his people are doing basically the same thing that I did all those years ago, was sitting in the middle of a, a soybean field watching for bees and the things that, that they were able to do. That I was impressed. He did basic basic beekeeping stuff. He made a map out of the waggle dance. I mean, that, how fundamental, but how cool is that? And it worked. He did interpreted the waggle dance, then went looking for the field that the waggle dance told them that they were going to. Von Frisch would have been proud. There's no <laughs> doubt about it. And then that they found that, there, you know, there really is making, uh, making uh, soybean nectar even here in Ohio. Where it's warmer, it's a lot more common. But I was even kind of surprised that there was soybean honey being made here. But yeah, 17% of the state of Ohio is covered with soybeans. So it probably is a lot more common than we thought. I think that's about it for today, Jeff. Uh, Reed was a... Was a uh, Fun to chat with, and I hope that he can come back again. Well, and it's very topical too, especially in just in uh, any day now that the bees are, or if they're not already there, they're rolling into the almond orchards. So uh, it's very timely information. Well, good. Thanks a lot, Kim. Yeah. Before we go, I'd like to thank our listeners and remind you to rate us, preferably with five stars, and uh, leave a uh, re- review on Apple Podcasts, wherever wherever you choose to listen to our stream, Beekeeping Today podcast. This helps other beekeepers find us quicker. You can also send questions and comments to questions at beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. And you can even send us beekeeping questions. We'll answer them in upcoming podcasts. And don't worry, if we can't answer them, we'll find an expert in the field who can. Finally, we want to thank Man Lake, where you can find anything you need for a successful season for sponsoring today's podcast with Reed Johnson. You can find out more about Man Lake at manlakelimited.com, and that's M-A-N-N-L-A-K-E-L-T-D.com. And while you're there, give them a shout out for bringing us this great show today. Thanks a lot, Kim. Yeah, and thanks, Man Lake, for uh, your support. We appreciate it. Jeff, I'll talk to you next time. All right, Kim, talk to you soon.